everyone. Thank you for being here today. So we have a wonderful speaker for this uh, human conversation. And uh, so we have Dr. Andrea Melado, Medrado, sorry, <laughs> who is a senior uh, lecturer at the University of Western Minister, Minister in UK. And she's also a member of the Cymru, the Communication and Media Research Institute. She also worked as a system uh, uh, work at, as an associate professor at the Federal Fluminense University in Brazil. Now, Andrea is the principal investigator for the project AI for Social Good, funded by UKRE and by the University of Western Minnesota University and Inclusion Research Community. She's also the co-I for the eVoices Redressing Marginalities Network Art and Humanities Research Council grant. And she's current the Vice President of the International Communication Media Research Association, the IMCR. And she just published her first book called Media Activism, Artivism, and the Fight Against Marginalization in the Global South, a South to South Communication, which have been published by Ruth Light, I think last week, right? Or two weeks ago, Andrea. So <laughs> welcome to this human conversation. We are really happy to have you. So if you want to share a little bit about your book before you jump in your presentation. Yeah. Oops. <laughs> Just got in the post yesterday. Uh oh, it's blurred the, the, <laughs> the background. Yeah. Hi, Matthias. Thanks everyone for being here. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, yeah, I'm Andrea Medrado. Um, yeah, the book actually is um, pre-order now. I can put the link in the in the chat later. So it hasn't like technically been released, but it's on the 26th of May. So um, it can be pre-ordered, but um, of course the way that things work, unfortunately, um, with Routledge, the cost, the price is, is quite high <laughs> for the for the for the hardcover book, but the ebook is a little bit more uh, realistic, but yeah, I mean, institutional copies, I guess that's the way. There's also a discount for institutional copies and people can also get in touch with me for like different chapters maybe and yeah, how to access the book. But yeah, OK, I won't spend too uh, long talking about this. Thank you so much, Mat Matthias, for having me here. I'm very happy to take part in this conversation. Uh, the paper that I present here today. Oh yeah, my voice doesn't usually sound like this. Um, I have a bit of a cold and a sore throat, so apologies that I sound a bit um, strange. But this paper, as you can see, the title, a, ca a Call for South to North Methodological Approaches to Critical AI Studies, is actually um, something that is co-authored with my colleague at the University of Westminster, uh, Dr. Peter Verdigan stemming from these projects um, on AI, questioning ideas of AI for social good, uh, drawing from Latin American uh, uh, methodological approaches. So I start this conversation by asking a question that has a very obvious answer. We all know that big tech benefits from artificial intelligence and profits a lot from it, but how are marginalized communities in the global south benefiting from AI? Um, when I was reading the work of Paola uh, Ricarte, a scholar from Ecuador who's based in Mexico, I learned about the work of Yasnaya Aguilar, a linguist from Oaxaca, Mexico, and she writes about the Western myth of perpetual economic growth. To cite uh, Yasnaya Aguilar, this growth advances through a digestive system that uses technology as one of its core components to basically chew up marginalized people and our planet, turning our planet into an in inhospitable place. So how are marginalized communities in the Global South benefiting from AI? Well, are they? Um, it's not an exaggeration. I think that, um, that this represents a form of new colonial order. So this paper reflects on, on these issues and as critical data scholars, uh, echoing, you know, Sebastian Lequede and other scholars, we should seek critical methodological approaches to answer these very uh, complicated and critical questions that relate to issues of power asymmetries between the so-called global north and global south. So, the usual quick pause for an explanation of what I mean by the term global south, which is obviously more than a geographic location, it refers to a kind of a line that separates those who are entitled to full rights or a lot of rights from those who are entitled to little rights or no rights. 
Um, but also the South communicates a kind of a political solidarity project between the different global South countries and contexts. And something that I find useful is that it triggers these conversations about painful colonial legacies, about colonial scarring, but also about perhaps about healing, you know, in this context. So it's a helpful term, but it's also a very problematic term. And maybe we can talk about that later in the Q&A. Um, but during our intellectual journey, south, traveling south to whatever we understand by the south, um, we draw inspiration from Latin American thinkers, specifically the Brazilian educator Paulo Freire and Colombian um, Orlando Falsborda. And we argue that answers about issues of AI and data justice must stem from those re the realities of those who are precisely the most affected by extractive digital capitalism, marginalized communities in the global south. So rather than treating the Latin American contexts as kind of test grounds where we can apply these models for the so-called north um, and apply them, you know, from the north to the south, we are proposing a turning around of this, you know, of these epistemological um, dynamics, adopting what we are calling a global south informed methodological framework with participatory action research or PAR. And forgot, yeah, when we do this, uh, we advocate, so that's what we're doing with this paper, calling for a greater embrace uh, of a south to north epistemological and methodological flow. And PAR is all about breaking hierarchies between the researcher and the researched, the subjects and the objects and the north and the south. So that's why this emerges as a priority. Another um, very quick explanation about participatory action research or PAR. Uh, it's a tradition that started as a response to, dev I mean, of course, there's participatory action approaches all over the world. We are referring here specifically about the Latin American tradition, which was very much a response to developmentalist approaches in Latin America, very kind of top down when organizations, researcher companies would just go to these impoverished communities in rural areas and start telling people, you know, what the problems are. Here's your problem. That's what you need to do to solve it. And of course, people started to resent this and challenge this. So PAR is very much rooted in this idea of confronting these top-down approaches, uh, also based in the vivencia, so the Portuguese or Spanish word for lived experiences of people, for people's actual lived experiences. And it also draws uh, from a sense of social change commitment. So it's a methodology that's not just about understanding the world. Sometimes we think of methodological approaches to help us understand the world, but this is also about trying to change the world very, in, um, you know, specifically this idea of commitment to change. And finally, this idea of rejecting asymmetries, as I said, with no boundaries between the researcher and the research uh, researched. We are all human on equal grounds trying to make, uh, trying to think of ways to make the world a better place. So, yeah, specifically from the struggle of the oppressed and the colonized to use two terms that are often associated with the work of the Brazilian educator Paulo Freire, for example. So if we return to the questions, to the research questions, in what ways can the Latin American traditions of participatory action research or PAR inspire us where we delve into issues of AI and data justice or injustice? How would this approach and would these approaches work if we are doing research, for example, uh, with a group of people who are from the global north or from middle cl class backgrounds, people who are not, you know, oppressed or or as oppressed and marginalized as, for example, some of the communities uh, that I worked with in Brazil, for example, like favelas, for example. So I ask this question because this is exactly what happened in our project. This was a small project. We got some uh, seed funding from the university to conduct a pilot, some workshops in London, so in the north, um, with a group of students, MA and BA students, who are, of course, mostly from kind of middle class, upper class backgrounds, our students at the university, but also tech workers and activists. It's a very diverse group, um, 13 nationalities, actually. But in any case, yes, how, how can we navigate through um, this, this context in which we are applying 
this kind of south informed approach in the so called north. And we agree uh, again with uh, Sebastian Lehuede, for example, when he says, well, a radical reflexivity needs to be at the center of critical data studies to ensure that we as researchers accidentally sometimes don't end up reproducing extraction patterns when we are conducting research, the same patterns that we often criticized. But when we were applying uh, these approaches, we had some constraints. Uh, for example, we were funded by uh, the impact office at the university. And as you probably know, I don't know in the Netherlands if it's similar, but the whole impact agenda is about having doing research that reaches beyond the walls of you know, the university, which is of course a good thing. But it also means that we have to shape projects in a certain way. We have to arrive you know, with aims that are very articulated with deliverables, things that we have to produce. And this, in a way, um, changes the nature of the whole participatory action research, which is all about having an open agenda and let the participants tell us what kind of deliverables they want. So yeah, there's a lot of challenges in this case, uh, but I can talk about that later as well. So we organized these workshops. It was a sequence of four days. In the first one, we had the stories, um, uh, stories, vivencias. So the principle of lived experiences. Um, we shared stories of AI in the everyday life of inv inv invisible workers in the global south, which triggered a conversation between the participants about AI uh, and inequality. At the end of the day, we decided that the participants would document their own my, uh, days in AI, and they made like pieces of collage, video, some kind of artistic production um, to talk about their days in AI. That happened in the second day. That's when the participants brought this creative piece about their days in AI. And then we asked them to empathize with each other. So they were like exposed to each other's context, each other's uh, days in AI. And we were asked them, you know, how do you empathize with this content from the other participants? And um, collectively, we elaborated a list of questions and problems that could be tackled with an intervention. And that came in the third day. That's when uh, we talked a bit about, you know, some of the problems with AI, for example, how uh, inputs come from one predominant source, which is often Western, white, male, powerful companies in the global north. Um, and then in the fourth day, finally, they we all worked together on designing a kind of a creative intervention to tackle these problems. But the, the aim here so much is not to, to, you know, to come up with a feasible intervention or something that can offer like a concrete solution, but it was just more of an exercise. So inspired by this principle of awareness raising or conscientization, conscientization from the work of uh, Paulo Freire and approaches uh, participatory action, we came up with kind of three areas of concern, main areas of concern, and that stemmed you know, from our activities with the participants. The first one is this idea of autonomy. So questions about how in a world you know, impacted by algorithms and automation, um, what kind of impact does that have on our autonomy over our social interactions online? The second question had to do with empathy, and I think there are a lot of uh, debates now about, you know, for example, chat GPT, large uh, language models and empathy, and they're trying to sound like humans and to understand feelings. So that was another issue. What are the implications of that? Of course, empathy is not something that's embedded in automated systems. So there was a lot of discussion about that. And finally, dialogue, the third area uh, in which we recognize the power asymmetries between users, uh, activists, policymakers, but you know, the tech giants, the companies. So how can we really have a constructive dialogue on AI and data driven technologies with such huge you know, power asymmetries? So we argue that our inspiration um, from PA, participatory action research principles, allowed us to expo uh, expose how um, current AI discourses, practices and realities are not compatible with some notions of autonomy, empathy and dialogue from a kind of a PA perspective. First, autonomy. There's a lot of debate about the so-called control problem. So, um, this concern with how human beings need to be in control over machines and AI systems. And in our project, um, another kind of discussion came up. 
how is it being decided who actually deserves autonomy? Who is allowed to be in control? If we think about AI ethical guidelines, for example, uh, the development of AI ethics is very much concentrated in North America, the EU, Japan, a handful of uh, Global North countries. So this underrepresentation or absence of large parts of the world means that the Global South is being excluded from having a say um, in this debate. Um, and of course, also the loss of autonomy in the Global South might have some really drastic dimensions like human rights violations, um, etc., which are, of course also happen in the Global North, but it's something that came uh, up in the project. Second, empathy. For Freire, uh, Paulo Freire, empathy is not just sharing the feelings of someone. Empathy is actually political. It's like taking the side of those who are oppressed. So um, this also came up in the workshops. Participants were kind of triggering themselves to use empathy in a political sense. For the My Day in, in AI exercise, you know, they were asked to empathize with each other and ask questions about who is the other? What is empathy? Does empathy make us uh, make the other more like us? And then the final concern is dialogue. As we know, a lot of the panic around AI revolve around, you know, this idea that machines are going to become or are more intelligent than humans. Dan McQuillan, for instance, um, talks about Western culture being about hierarchies of intelligence. And well, power approaches are actually about challenging these ideas of the hierarchies of knowledge. From a decolonial perspective, decolonial um, scholarship, if we think about it, there are concepts like, for example, pluriversality, which are completely the opposite of this. You know, it's about many world, a world in which many worlds uh, coexist. So there are no claims of superiority, superior intelligence, superior knowledge. So this again was another contrast uh, that we are, are working with in our research. Um, so. To conclude, in this paper, uh, we are proposing a sort of south to north flow using participatory action approaches, challenging the ways in which the centrality of the north, or so-called what we understand by the north, is taken for granted when it comes to epistemologies, experiences and knowledges related to AI. Our findings, and again, this is a project in preliminary stages. We had this pilot in London, but it's becoming bigger. We plan, for example, to conduct these workshops in Brazil. Um, it, yeah, so um, yeah, we are, we are here suggesting that AI is a tool for coloniality in three ways that relate to autonomy, empathy and dialogue. Acknowledging the extreme implications of losing autonomy for marginalized populations in the global south, for example, the difference between freedom and incarceration, resistance and non-existence, life and death. Second, uh, we show that the current AI discourses contradict from a Freirean, you know, power perspective, ideas of empathy as being political and siding up with the so-called oppressed. And third, finally, we review how these current AI discourses and practices are based often on sort of ranking, algorithmic rankings of the world, hierarchies of intelligence, which again are not compatible with the dialogical notions proposed by authors like Freire and Orlando Falsborda. With this research, we also learned that rather than following this AI hype, looking for solutions that people are asking for, we can focus on the everyday AI experiences uh, like we did, for example, with my day in AI exercise in the workshop. And these everyday AI stories can be told, listened to and shared in pluriversal ways with a respect uh, for plurality of conceptions and understandings. So thank you. These are some initial ideas. I think I went over time. Sorry, Matthias. So I will now shut up and, and yeah, let's start talking. Thank you so much. Sorry for going over time. No, it's perfect, Andrea. Thank you so much for sharing with us this wonderful study that you and Peter um, have done. Uh, First, I want to ask the audience to send their, her, the, their questions in the chat so you can write there and you can also use the Q&A button. Uh, before we get the questions from the audience while they're typing, I have a couple of questions. One, it's about the global south. When you're starting your presentation, you mentioned that this is a problematic term, right? And then we see a lot of people using, you know, 
known word countries sometimes like the words that they mention is like the western educated industrialized rich and democratic countries to explain um the rest of the world right then we have the expression the rest of the world so no word the rest of the world um the majority of the world so there is a lot of terms to describe this other part of the world that it's beyond you know like this rich and western countries why this is a problematic term and how we can you know like use that as how critical data studies are uh, addressing that and how what is more the more useful term to use in relation to that in your opinion Thank you. Thank you so much, Matthias. Yes, absolutely. It is a problematic term. I've been talking with a lot of colleagues about it. One colleague says we should write a paper one day about how the term Global South was probably invented in the Global North. Um, so yeah, I mean, it lumps together the other uh, and the others as a monolith and, you know, all the different Souths as if they're the same. Um, so it essentializes the South and yes, of course, and that is always uh, very problematic. I have nevertheless been used, and I use uh, specifically in my in my work in the book that just came out now, the idea of South to South, um, because I think the element of the South that is actually helpful for me personally is, is like a strategic thing. And I, I just saw that there's a question actually on South to South here in the chat, but before we go there, um, this idea of the solidarity project of the Global South is what interests me. So even though I acknowledge, you know, that the term is problematic in a, in a sense of lumping together the others, it's also strategic in a sense of enabling this conversation. So I'm thinking of the Global South as a kind of a conversation starter, as something that enables us to, to talk uh, to each other, a lot and I'm actually finding that quite useful in, in, in my research, although of course I acknowledge that there are a lot of problems like there are problems with the other terms as well. There are problems with, you know, when you use majority world, when you use, I don't know, um, some people criticize, for example, terms like people of color, which center whiteness and everything is, you know, evolving around whiteness. So there's always going to be problems and, and, and advantages in using the term. In my work specifically, I'm using it just because it enables me to start these conversations that I think are important to have, particularly when we think of data extraction, inequality, uh, colonial legacies, coloniality. So that's the sense in which I'm using the term, even though, of course, I also acknowledge that it's probably a term invented in the North and it has this kind of problematic uh, dimensions as well. I hope I answered. Yes, no, it's really a good, uh, as I mentioned, like a good way to start the discussion. Think about the Global South. Remind ourselves that this is an important region that we should always think about. So we have read some questions from the audience. Please keep sending the questions. So we'll continue my uh, questions later on uh, as we have a couple of questions read. So one, the first one is from Asli and she's like, thank you for um, the valuable insight that you share it. Considering the fact that AI actually feeds and grows on human data or interaction and experience centralized on the global north, would your work based on the countering the domination of AI or rather uh, more realistically try to explore into AI for social good through the power sourced in the global south? What are the what is your take based on your current research and this possibility of the south south cooperation? It's a long question, but I think you got, yeah, you can explore a bit that. Yeah, I'll go over the, I'm reading them and I'm going to go over them one by one. Thank you so much, Asli. Yes, these are it's a, excellent questions. Um, well, yes, I indeed like, you know, all the interaction experience centralized on the global north and is my work centering on countering the domination of AI. I mean, what I've done at so far, as I said, this is the initial uh, stage of the project. So we developed a pilot applying this, you know, principles inspired, we prefer to say, because as I said, there's some serious limitations in terms of if we think about, you know, the kind of more grassroots participatory action research, we weren't really able to do that with all the constraints that we have, for example, in the higher education system in the UK. Um, yeah, so we were inspired by PA and the way we did it is that we conducted these workshops 
in London with the group that I mentioned. So students, tech, some tech workers, some tech activists from the London scene. Um, so in a way, I'm not still, I'm not doing the research in the Global South yet in terms of the actual data, the empirical data that we are collecting. We, although we do have this data from the workshops that we conducted in London, at this first stage, we are using the sort of South as an epistemological and methodological category, being inspired by this sort of Southern methodological approaches. Um, yeah, possibility of South South co cooperation. Yes, absolutely. Um, so OK, so now the next stage is that we got a little bit more funding. And now, you know, all these discussions that we had here, for example, about dialogue, about empathy, about autonomy, we're, we're hoping to have that in groups with activists in Brazil that I know quite a few uh, groups, for example, from favelas working in this space there. And it would be quite interesting now to contrast with the discussions that we had here and also to expand into this idea of South to South, because that's actually like what my my work, um, the work that generated the book was about. We were working with groups in Brazil and groups in Kenya. And um, so, yeah, we, we hope to continue doing that. But for now, we've done it here in London. We're going to do it in Brazil and we hope to expand it as well to other uh, Global South countries because the South to South cooperation is actually uh, yeah, at the center of of my works. But because it's a new project, we are still going to do that in a way. I don't know if I answered your question. You answered most of your questions. Um, I have a one question related to what you said, then I'm going to continue with the audience questions. You mentioned that you brought together you know, students and also people from civil society, black women coders and gig economy works in this part session that you had. Um, but you also mentioned that they couldn't offer as much in input as you were expecting. Why was that? Could you tell us a little bit more why this happened that these black women coders and the gig economy works couldn't inf influence this input? And you, you think that this is also some lesson that you're going to take when you apply that in the global south? Absolutely. Thank you, Matthias, for raising it. Yes, absolutely. Well, the way that the project started, um, we because it was a kind of an impact project at the university, we uh, were expected to be engaging with partners. So one of the first partners that we engaged with was an organization of uh, tech workers, it's a, a, a sort of union, a union uh, of tech workers and black women coders, another group. So we contacted them, we messaged them, we got in touch with them, had initial chats with them. When it came to the actual workshops that we were inviting them to come, we had some significant challenges. Um, and this is kind of yeah, a topic for a lot of, of debate. So, you know, for example, from uh, the perspective of the universities here, research, you're, you're, you're expected to incentivize your participants, right? For example, in my university uh, with vouchers, you cannot be, for example, direct payment, financial rewards, because that would compromise the ethics uh, of the research, right? You you cannot have, you know, all the participants actually participating because they're getting paid to participate. But of course, if you're working with groups from marginalized communities and in London, a super expensive city with the cost of crisis, living crisis, and, you know, these groups of activists who are of, often like really under-resourced and overstretched, how can you expect that people actually, you know, will use their time to come to your workshop to contribute to your project if they don't get something very concrete out of it? So we, you know, we tried, for example, and being very, very honest and candid here um, to talk to them. And we had these vouchers that we were offering. But honestly, like it's a lot of investment that you are expecting. And then you go to the university and how the project are set up and you try to explain this, but they go, no, but I'm sorry, that's, there's nothing we can do. There's a limit. You can only offer vouchers. So it's something that we're trying to work out. You know, how can we really do this kind of co-design, co-participation if our participants don't get as much from the project as we as researchers? You know, of course, there's the knowledge that's going to be generated. And that's usually how um, how I we all discuss, you know, oh, well, 
the communities are going to get the findings, the results and etc. But something concrete and tangible that actually benefits them. You know, in, in Brazil, that was always, always, always the case, like a lot of reciprocity involved. So, for example, I was doing work in favela communities. I was teaching class voluntarily, voluntarily um, offering something in return, because otherwise, if it's not reciprocal, how are these groups going to really participate in our projects? So anyway, it's a challenging one, but um, just to to give you some idea of some of the challenges that we were facing. And yeah, I'm Great. sure a lot of you have you might have similar experiences. Great answer, Andrea. Thank you for sharing that and being very candid about that. I just want to ask you if you want to stop sharing your uh, slides. Then oh, we yes. Can see you, then we're going to spotlight <laughs> you because I think you are yes, the most yes, important yes, person here. Sorry. No, no, it's fine. And then while you're doing that, so we want to uh, ask you about uh, a question that we have here from Alvaro. First, it, he's asking if you can share the link for this paper, if you have read published. And the other question, uh, I think Andrea Cornwall ideas on space for transformation and particularly about power dynamics within the group of people that were involved in this study. And then his question goes in this direction. What are the guardrails we're taking in consideration to address the divide between expert opinions by tech works? So what we're saying, you know, and known specialists like every other group that participates, so students and etc. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you so much, Alvaro. We have written a paper. I mean, we have presented, we are actually presenting these uh, ideas in a few conferences. So the Association of Internet Researchers Conference, the next one. So we have it in kind of short form for these conferences and we have actually written a longer paper, but it is still uh, under consideration. So hopefully <laughs> It will be published. I'm sure it will, you know, as I said, it's a it's a work in progress, so I'm sure it will go through some reviews and etc. But um, yeah, keep you posted if it's, you know, as hopefully it will be published soon. Uh, in terms of guardrails uh, experts, no, we actually we didn't. Well, the whole point was that we had everyone together in the group. We had a, a, a couple of uh, of tech workers in the group who came to the workshops. Students. We also had undergraduate students and postgraduate students. We also had students from computer science and students from media and not no non you know tech technological no the non geeks. We were we were joking, and everyone was discussing on an on an equal level, equal ground. So there wasn't really like any kind of a uh, division between their perspectives. All the activities were like collectively done. We didn't really um, separate, you know, between the, the the experts. Although, of course, some insights. I mean, actually, uh, now that I think about it, this one insight about the dialogue and how do we bridge, for example, um, with such power asymmetries. Uh, we all talk about dialogue, but do the tech giants really want to have dialogues about this? They they don't, right? So, these insights actually came from some of the tech workers. But we didn't really um, do, you know, a, a kind of a division of of, of opinions between them. So, yeah, yeah, no, okay. and then we're going to touch in a topic that everyone is talking about. So generative AI and one of the questions here from Isabella, uh, it's mentioning about that we see that media reproduce these stereotype, stereotypical representations of groups. And then she's mentioned that in specifically chat GPT, should we to uh, to generate content that also reproduce this kind of stereotypes. An example, she mentioned that ChatGPT assumed that a doctor is a man and not a woman. And then what are the risks that these tools and in this case generative AI can bring for uh, marginalized other groups in your opinion, Andrea? Absolutely, I just did an experiment now with Bard uh with with uh well my son uh, i was talking at the beginning of the presentation was very interested in this issue of uh the bard saying that the the, the this generative ai saying that they actually understand feelings and stuff like that but i i did a i did a test like i was playing with it and i said can you create a short story of a brazilian and a, a short uh funny love story of a brazilian and a british and i didn't specify gender and the story, my God, first of all, was not funny at all. <laughs> and second, the Brazilian, of course, was a woman. 
the British was a man. I think it was like Clara, Brazilian woman, and David, the British. And it was something like about the British saying, oh, the Brazilian women are the most beautiful in the world. And the British men are the best humor. And I was like, oh, my God, give me a break. <laughs> this is such like a, a stereotype. So, of course, I think all the debates we've been having with Google and how it represents, you know, black women, how, you know, searches for the, the work of Safia Noble, you know, searches for black women, searches for Brazilian women, searches for scientist never you know even uh, you never see a woman as a scientist i think all that you know is is replicated and actually amplified again by the generative ai so the risks again are really uh i think really harmful again in terms of knowledge you know the the, the people from the south are never uh, part of this of these uh scripts and what it comes up from this as kind of generators of knowledge never so I think the risks are, you know, indeed, again, um, very, very serious and very harmful. So, yes, I agree with you. No, no that's a really good point, um, because our next question is also related to that, these harms that are affecting people. So first, uh, uh, Thiago was like, congratulating for this amazing work that you present, Andrea. And then his question Thank was you. how to bring autonomy for the users when some contexts that they are very dependent on these platforms to work or complete simple tasks. And let's give you, for example, the, you know, uh, migrants, the, when they move to another country, they need to use platforms, for example, of these apps to work at, as liver, to deliver food or, you know, something or work, for example, as a Uber. And so we're, they're really dependent on these platforms that are built on AI. And so there is a way to hack the AI or force the question of regulation in a, uh, of AI in favor of the oppressed, in your opinion? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I just forgot to uh, also thank for the suggestions um, of readings that were in the um, in the previous comment. But yes, to return to this. Um, no, I agree. I think I mean, our work hasn't looked into that specifically to be honest with you yet, or at least not at this stage. But I believe that one, you know, once we go uh, work with the groups in Brazil, for example, the groups of activists, a lot of them are involved in the kind of uh, data activism space. Um, we have a friend, yeah, Rafael Groman, who's working with uh, with uh, with with collectives, with platform workers, with how people are mobilized exactly to 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 hack the AI. We know it's not easy. Um, again, issues of power asymmetry, but I think it's a really interesting space um, to look into. And I think the groups that we are going to work in Brazil are going to be quite insightful in that respect. And um, yeah, again, issues of regulation are not something that we have looked into as well yet into 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 the work in current stages. But I think there are also lots of debates now going on in, in terms of how to regulate AI with, of course, a lot of resistance from the from the tech giants. The debates now going on in Brazil, in the US, you know, and absolutely like um, I think this is a space that we should um, explore more. So, yeah, thank you so much for the question. And taking on that for, about the regulations concerning AI, do you believe that these regulations are really like giving voice to these oppressed, marginalized communities? So they're being part of these regulations or are just, you know, like uh, Western or white people that are in the power and then define what is important to regulate. So how we can involve these people that are really affected by these tools and these solutions, in your opinion, is part a solution to, for example, governments to listen then to, have their opinion and to understand the risk for these communities? Yeah, we should, right? And we are not, absolutely. We are not including at all. And would power be a solution? <laughs> Maybe it could be a very interesting approach, of course. The danger then, uh, it's something that I'm struggling. I, again, I'm going to be very candid and honest here. Something that I'm struggling a bit with this project that I fear is that we are kind of packaging a very radical methodological approach if we think about the roots of pa you know in the 70s like very kind of political and we're kind of packaging it 
as a solution that can be then you know uh, exported or or sold you know to 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 partners in the kind of the way that things work for example with grants and projects so but um but i think that absolutely is people again are not being heard are not being involved in decision making i know that the groups of activists in the brazilian space are very vocal about that and trying to come up with their inputs now with the new government there's at least a little bit more of hope although of course there are problems and limitations as well but we should absolutely be, be, be pushing for that with our uh, agendas and I mean in within the south as well going back to the whole point of problematizing the south and north um, in the south there are lots of norths as well and vice versa so in within you know countries of the so-called global north are so many people who are excluded, so many levels of exclusion within the exclusion within the exclusion, uh, which make it really complicated. I mean, even when I was doing work, for example, with favela groups in the favela realities, there were groups in the favelas who were more excluded than other people. There were the privileged favela groups and the less privileged favela groups. So there's so many layers of exclusion as well that, um, you know, it would ideally would be taken into account, but um, are not being taken into account. And I have a like um, <laughs> Sorry. provocative question relates to the use of power in the global north. We know that you saw during this workshop and then you can share uh, with us your opinion on how did you realize the importance of that for the global north context. But when you go and check who is doing power, it's more research from the global south or doing with people from the global south. Do you know why this is happening? Why there is this concern of scholars, let's call from the global south, then from people in the global north, or is this a context that maybe it's not relevant in the global north? And even though if you bring this approach to the global north, they will not appreciate or they will not understand or they will not un how to apply that. So yeah, some provocative questions for you, yeah. Carol, your opinion. Yeah, no, that's a good question. I mean, hmm. um, I don't know if this maybe has something to do. You know, the whole debate, it's it's a very bad uh, expression. I, I hate it, but the, there's so many debates, for example, when you're doing ethnographic research about studying down, studying up. So when you're studying groups that are marginalized and you yourself are not part of a marginalized community, you're kind of studying down. Yeah. So I think in a way, uh, I don't know if again, it's a way in which as researchers from the so-called Global South, we are also marginalized in a way and in other ways we are privileged in our own contexts. So our positionality is a very complex one here as well. But there's this idea that, well, it's a kind of a marginalized approach, so it's going to work better with marginalized contexts. It's going to answer better, you know, questions about marginalization, in marginalized contexts. But of course, the other way around doesn't work, right? You can have lots of methodological approaches developed in the so-called North. And because of universalist ways of thinking about the world, you know, that the North is always prevalent, it is assumed that they work anywhere and you can actually apply them anywhere and then we will unveil something useful. But the other way around, when you have an approach that stems from so-called South um, realities, it is assumed that they will work better, you know, in these kind of Southern realities and not so much here. And it was part of what we were trying to do as well. We did get a question once in a conference like, well, but um, why were you researching, you know, people in London and not uh, and I mean, it's part of how the project was structured. We started with a pilot, we started here, and I actually think that it made it quite interesting. And we are making a case that, you know, it's it's quite useful as well to, why not use this kind of no, uh, south to north um, approaches as well? Does it mean that's going to work perfectly? No. Does it mean that some of the issues that we are discussing, for example, problematic things to do with dialogue, autonomy, empathy, do not apply in the in the north? you know because oh that just applies in the south no like it might apply in the north as well but we're just trying to shift around a bit the dynamics you know in in, in a modest way but um yeah i don't know i hope i answered your your question no definitely and then the question from panayota it's really related to this topic as well so we're seeing a lot of about this global south global north uh dichotomy but then other than the broad 
political critique of digital technology and their neo-colonial and capitalist regime. Do you think there is a more specific South North division in respect to AI, <coughs> especially concerning the areas that you mentioned in your talk about autonomy, empathy, and dialogue? So what's your opinion? Yes, thank you so much. Another great question. As I said, at this point, we have the, the data and away from the North, from the workshops that we did in London, and we haven't done them yet in Brazil. Uh, but I have a feeling now, for example, the discussions about autonomy that came up in the in the workshops in in London, uh, it was an autonomy very much in a kind of a individualistic sense. Like people were like concerned, for example, about recommendation systems and like, wow, you know, I'm being told what to look, what to search, where to go. And actually, yes, I just realized that the, the workshops were before Chat GPT. So that's why like the, the whole chat GPT stuff didn't really come up, you know, in our workshops, but very much things about recommendation systems taking away our, our autonomy to decide, to choose things that just showing us content and we can not think for ourselves. That was kind of very much like the perspective here in London uh, that came from the stemmed from the workshops. Whereas when we think about issues of autonomy stemming from marginalized realities, uh, poor neighborhoods, for example, that are excluded from policy completely. I mean, Paula Ricarte was doing some really interesting research about this government uh, tools, AI tools, that uh, working with uh, marginalized children and youth in impoverished neighborhoods in in Latin America and issues of of yeah, and how these uh, tools could predict, you know, the chances of that child. Uh, being a criminal or a good citizen. And of course, as it always happens, you know, poor kids, black kids from poor areas are predicted to grow up and become a, a criminal or the kids of a single mom and stuff like that. So if we think about these issues of decision, people having access to decision, to accesses and uh, stuff like that in the global south, you know, of course it, it, it changes radically. Uh, but at the, at, the, at the moment, what I have are like hints, a feeling, you know, about these different dimensions. And I think it's going to be really interesting to explore once we have expanded the project and looked at these other um, contexts as well. So thank you. Thank you for answering this question. And then we have here a really insightful uh, comment and then a question from Alvaro. So first, he thank you for also okay. um, the answer, the conversation that uh, we are having here. And then building up on these ideas that we discussed here, he mentioned that sometimes for individuals, it is really hard to understand more extensive forms of alg algorithmic violence and damage yes. that is already being done. So there is a lot of evidence from social protect system that's already discriminating on the basis of AI analysis, justice and law system that further exclude and racialize um, known uh she she woman and ex etc so and then he was reading a lot of about how sex workers data have been scrapped from special specialized websites and so to border control so current and former sex work throw are thrown in the jail which is also something that uh it's a, a lot of concern so Based on that, he built this question that is asking, is there a space for a South to South cooperation that serves to remediate into these measures, particularly in the form of rights to forget, plus technology so sovereignty that gets more of this perspective into consideration in national tech infrastructures? And then I'm going to let for the last question if we have from the audience or I can ask the last question because we're going to finalize in a bit. But yeah, so the floor is yours, Andrea. This is a really complicated question, but it's really interesting, and I would love to yes. hear your opinion on that. No, I think that's a that's a brilliant insight. I, I think, and and an area that uh, could be fl further explored. How to develop this uh, south to south? Sorry, I'm just copying the the link of my book before the call is uh, <laughs> in over. Um, I think that's absolutely. Um, let me go back to the question. Sorry, I lost concentration here a little bit. Absolutely, so I think the that there's South some South really, yeah. really interesting spaces for South to South cooperation. Absolutely. And it's a bit what we did with the with the book that 
I just posted a link, but it was much more. I wasn't working uh, in the book with issues of of data justice, data injustice. We were working more like I was coming from a kind of a digital activism and artivism perspective, but it's a bit what we've done. You know, we had groups talk to each other and exchange knowledge, exchange resources, for example, on issues of representation of marginalized populations. So I think this would be a space really that could be so rich uh, in terms of because we know that there are groups doing really interesting work in these spaces and if they connect, you know, and if they work together, um, I think that a lot of interesting uh, insights could come up. I did write down the emails and the suggestions. I'll put my email in the chat as well. One final thing that I forgot to say that I think is an important point is that sometimes as well, like we have an agenda and again, that connects to the point of pa arriving and being open minded. And hey, what do you want to? What, what are the questions that you want to ask? Sometimes when we come and we talk to marginalized groups about AI and um, a group of Latin American researchers were talking about that as well, like um, in a group that I was working with. But sometimes people don't want to talk about AI, like they want to talk about other problems. For example, you go to a group of uh, residents, association, favelas, and they want to talk about sanitation. They want to talk about police violence. They want to talk about lack of water. And we come with, a, you know, with the technology, with the AI agenda. That's another aspect that uh, sometimes I find um, a contradiction that we have as well in our research, you know, that sometimes um, there's so many really, really urgent um, issues stemming from the marginalized that we need to be um, open to listen. But of course, yes, I absolutely agree that the issue of algorithmic violence and uh, erasure and so many are, are, are very, well, I find them extremely urgent and this South to South cooperation, I think would be an interesting space to, um, to, to, to explore, to further explore. Uh, so, as we don't have uh, a last question from the audience, so I'll do the last question because I'm very interested in that. And mainly when you're mentioned from the South to South Corporation is something that's really challenging because, you know, we we are dealing with inside the Global South, so many regions and inside of these regions, we have different countries, right? So, for example, we have Latin America uh, and then in Latin America, you have like Brazil that's quite developed. And then you have in Central America, some countries that are suffering from authoritarian governments. And one thing that you mentioned in, in, by the end of your presentation was about instead of following this AI hype would be more uh, helpful to folks on the everyday AI experience, right? Um, which you call vivencias. So what will be the role of the media in this AI hype? Because I'm very interested in media, so that's what I, it's my uh, focus about AI technology. So in call, uh, what could be in terms of sharing this AI experience for these people that are from these marginalized communities, for example? Thanks, Matthias. Yes, that's a very good question as well. I mean, um, the media representations are sometimes so dystopian, right? And the whole issue of, I think it was a few months ago, wasn't it? That the whole thing of the Google engineer who was, uh, oh, the, 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 the LLM is becoming its feelings, is having feelings and uh, it's becoming human. And I think so, this kind of dystopian narratives, they end up taking a lot of space and they're interesting, I think, from a kind of storytelling perspective. But the structural elements, the, the, the algorithmic discrimination, so concrete and so tangible that we were talking about here earlier, uh, I think are so much more important. It should be, you know, part of the of the way in which the media covers AI stories or stories of AI. I think those stories need to be echoed much more. Like, I mean, the things that we were just talking about, you you ask, you know, Bard or ChatGPT to create a script or to give you, I don't know, uh, it's always so Northern centric. There's so many experiences being erased uh, again in such violent ways and I think if we really go to the kind of everyday stories of AI from a sort of global south marginalized perspectives these come to the fore and that's we realize actually you know these experiences of the world these vivencias of the world are very much again western call it western or northern and they're not really speaking you know for experiences of so many people um, I think that would be much much more interesting I think than the whole um, dystopian hype 
and the structural elements as well. Like again, like you know, the tech, the giant tech companies, and how they profit. And but in uh, but 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 we get us a, a bit distracted sometimes by the whole like oh I don't know like uh, Bard has feelings and it's becoming a human and can fall in love or whatever, <laughs> and uh, being distracted by some really really important questions that should be asked. I hope I answered. Of course, and thank you so much, Andrea. It was a really interesting conversation, and thank you also uh, for accepting this invitation and sharing your bit of your time with us, with your experience, your vivencias. And I'm really happy with also our audience that was really active here and share a lot of questions, insight, comments, and I hope um, we you can also follow. Uh, Andrea on the social media platforms that if when she published this study, you can find it. So you can share your uh, Twitter account or whatever you have, Andrea, oh. there so people can oh, find wow. it. Oh, wow. I feel like a digital influencer now. Yeah, you're almost. <laughs> so besides that, Twitter. I want to also say, uh, yeah, keep an eye on our uh, oh, newsletter okay. because subscribe if you're not, oh. sub didn't subscribe to our newsletter, we're also going to share this video later if you want to watch again. And also, uh, we can share your study when we have that on our uh, web page as well. But thank you so much again. Thank you also, Irina, who helped us here. And yeah. Thank you so much. This was a really, really good, brilliant conversation. I'm sorry if my initial presentation ended up taking a bit too long oh. and taking away from the conversation part, but I really felt like we could have a conversation. And thank you so much, Mat Matthias, for, for having me, inviting me. I feel like, like, share, comment. <laughs> I feel like a, like a millennial digital influencer kind of thing. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for having me.